Welcome to another edition of Answers Network. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and each week, this show will bring on special guests that can inspire, educate, and in some cases, entertain. And I guarantee you, this one's going to entertain. So uh, we're going to be bringing answers and options to making our lives happier, healthier, and more successful. Now, I could say the same thing about my guest co-host today, Jesse LeBeau. Jesse is one of today's most highly sought after youth speakers. His unlikely underdog story has inspired millions of teens through his speaking, best-selling books and youth programs. Now his new reality series, The LeBeau Show, allows viewers the chance to see firsthand the major impact he is having on youth. His current focus is expanding the Attitude Advantage program that is helping transform the lives of thousands of teenagers by improving their mental health building their self-esteem, and instilling incredible confidence. Now, if you'd like to know more about the Attitude is Everything Foundation that he is a part of, check out one of our past shows uh, by typing Attitude into the search bar on the Answers Network website, where we go into much greater detail about the positive effects they've had on thousands of young people. Now, this obviously is making Jesse a great fit to co-host today's show. And as always, Answers Network will address many ways of creating greater health, joy, and love for you and your family. Now, um, they will also introduce you to top professionals and talented authors who are working to make this world a better place for all of us. Now, I'd really appreciate it if you could all do me a big favor. Please forward at least one of our shows to your social media group or to someone you know who can benefit from today's subject. This is one powerful way we can make a positive difference together. So, Jesse, before we get to our guest, please share with us what you've been up to lately, because I don't think I've seen you since before COVID. Man, m trying to survive. What, yes. uh, what a crazy time from what's going on with mental health and people getting through. Uh, just is your job going to be secure? What's going on with your family? How do you survive to the political landscape, even if you're not a political person, which I don't really consider myself to be, you get sucked in and pulled in these things and people are trying to get you in on their tribalism. And it's like, I just want to focus on the things that make me happy, serve other people. And uh, for us, we saw that I couldn't go and do these live events in schools right. and with youth organizations. So we've had this program that we've done that's with a hard copy, with a, with a workbook, with different books. And we pivoted and made the whole thing virtual like everyone had to do. Um, and it's honestly, it's been incredible. It's allowed us to have a much deeper impact than we were able to have um, before. And so it's just a beautiful thing coming out of this, we're gonna be able to scale and reach so many more kids. And the whole focus for us is building self-esteem, improving mental health. And if all of those things are in alignment, it helps every other aspect of kids' lives. And I love that, especially with today's guest of having these aha moments and, and having these breakthroughs of like, hey, my life can go in two directions. And am I gonna take the easy path or am I gonna, it's less scary and I might get judged if I fail, or am I gonna go for it and, and, and live an incredible you know, a life where I'm a leader and I'm not doing what everyone else is doing on social media and everyone around me. So for us, it's, a, it's been a beautiful thing to really focus on just building incredible confidence in kids and, and in their families. Well, and, and again, I think of you as a leader, and I think that's one of the things that leaders do also is something happens. Things are going to happen in all of our lives. And, uh, and I thought, you know what, he's just going to reach more people. You know, you, know you, you, you now can't take your, your giant motorhome out and go to every, every high school out there, but you are going to reach them. And so now like situations like this through Zoom and things like that, going to reach more kids and we're going to raise more kids up to become the the passionate young people that we know they can be so yeah it, it's that it's that um this quote that i love it you got to prepare the kids you got to prepare the teens you got to prepare the children for the road and not prepare the road for the kids and that's what we're trying to do i know all of us here um because you want them to be able to stand on their own two legs you want them to be Absolutely. able to make the decision when they're in that situation where hey are you going to decide something that can make you a statistic and start you on this downward spiral or do you have the the skills and the tools and the confidence to be stand up for what you know is right and what you know you should or shouldn't do so you know that's the power to me is giving it putting it in their hands and taking it away maybe from the parents that are trying to you know protect and have have the best of intentions but in the end it's actually hurting them more than it's helping them 
Yeah. And again, it's, I think it's just being value added, you know, we're, we're going to provide as much value as we can uh, for those that need it. So now um, how can people learn more about the things that you're doing? Because I know that it's changing um, any yeah. upcoming events or anything. And if so, what's the best way to get involved? Yeah, it's been exciting. We've been starting to get um, in-person live events again, um, post-pandemic. So that's been exciting. And we're rolling this out to go to a different city every month um, and live stream it and plug in all the schools in the community with in the whole city and, and state with our programs. So um, the, the new site is the attitudeadvantage.com. And then just my name, if you put it in there, jessielebeau.com has you know, a ton more uh, information if you want to check it out. So all right. and um, I easy to find. And I assume people can follow you on Instagram and all of oh, those. Oh yeah, on all there. Yeah. <laughs> Although doing a lot less on there and okay. finding I'm a lot happier. I, I like that too. Now, for those of you, if you're driving and you're trying to figure out how do I spell that? First of all, Jesse's last name is spelled L-E capital B-E-A-U. Uh, so, uh, but again, don't feel like you have to write this down. You can go to answers.network and we're going to have all of that information for you. Um, and you know, we're talking about what we believe in, and I'm a firm believer that our greatest shortage today is not found in material things. Our greatest shortage is of great leaders, and great leaders have a passion to make a positive difference in the world, which mm. leads me to a couple of quotes that I believe foreshadow our topic today. And one is, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right thing. And that's by Peter Drucker. Another one is, you can do anything as long as you have the passion, the drive, the focus, and the support, which is where all of us come in. And that is by Sabrina Bryan. So Jesse, what does leadership mean to you? You know, there was a, there was a quote I remember seeing on a poster when I was in high school in San Diego. I was at this Christian high school, it was called. And it said, evangelize every day, everywhere you go. And when necessary, use words. And I always stuck with me. And I feel that way so much today about leadership. It's like, I, I like the person that gives to charity and there isn't a, a, a press release about it. Yes. You know, I like the person who's living their life and doing the right thing and doesn't need, you know, the, the significance factor, the attention and, and all these things. And so much today, people are all about like uh, to me, your, your social media is just like your own personal PR and everyone mm -hmm. wants to show I'm a good parent. My, I'm a, you know, my son hit the home run, which are, these are all good things, but I think, mm -hmm. feel like it's so much about us. And I really believe leadership is lit, walking the walk and letting people, that's the best example. Instead of going and telling everyone what they should do, just go live it and let them see that. And um, that, that to me is really the, the, the big takeaway and what I'm striving to be better at when it comes to leadership. All right. Very well said. Well, our topic today is when the light bulb goes on, helping teenagers find their life passion. And uh, as I said, something both of our guests, um, both our guest and my co-host do with a great passion uh, of their own. Now, over the past 15 years, our guest, Paul Otis, has worked as a science teacher and school administrator, sharing his passion for providing students with inquisitive experiences that allow them to experience science firsthand. As an avid rock climber, trail runner, and skier, Paul enjoys exercising in the outdoors and sharing his love of outdoor sports with students as the associate head of school at Lake Tahoe Preparatory School. It's a, college, it's a college preparatory boarding school located near Lake Tahoe in California. And uh, if you've never been to Lake Tahoe, you should check it out. It's truly one of the most beautiful places in the world. Now, through his role, Paul has been able to use his experience as a teacher and mentor to help teenagers on their life's journey. He holds a bachelor's of science degree in environmental science from the University of Colorado Boulder and a master's degree in teaching from Sierra Nevada College. Paul is with his wife, Julie, their son, Aaron, their daughter, Amy, on their north, on the north shore of Lake Tahoe. I'm jealous already in California. Paul, welcome to Answers Network. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, um, it is my pleasure to, to have you. And, um, you know, for those people that don't know, I mean, I, I, you know, I work with at-risk youth as well. And, uh, I mean, Paul is one of the people who has dedicated his life to, to helping kids that might be struggling or, or having some difficulty with making the right decisions. 
Um, so Paul, share a little bit about, um, you know, why you believe that teens often struggle to find their passion um, or their purpose in life. Sure, sure. Well, I think the, the teenage years, as everyone knows, are a difficult time of life. Uh, uh, students are very impressionable. They're striving for independence. Uh, they're, they're constantly uh, wanting to kind of get away from their, their parents' watchful eye and try out some really adult things. Um, and we, we as educators know that, that kids are ready to try out some of those adult things with supervision. Um, I think that sometimes students reaching for success and finding their passion and uh, also becoming independent, all of these things can kind of take their own path. And so sometimes for students, um, moving out on their own can put them into some risky situations and um, not to mention all of the other kind of influences at play in modern society that can distract students from staying on track with your typical uh, typical do well in high school, move on to college, move into uh -huh. a career and, and, and family. And so I think a lot of students can really stay quite stagnant, um, lost in the, slipping through the cracks, you might say, um, where other adults don't take a big interest in them. They don't have really a lot of outlets and are just, um, just kind of lackluster, not really able to, to come into their own. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, do you believe that the COVID lockdown has affected this struggle that teens are having to find their passion? And if so, in what way? Absolutely, Alan. You know, I'm right now I'm, I'm getting a lot of students right here on our school campus uh, that have really struggled online for the last year. I think that uh, online learning is very difficult for anyone, even at the college or, 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 or uh, post uh, post collegiate level. I think that for middle school students and for high school students, while they are capable of independent learning, um, I think that the soft skills, the social emotional skills were really lacking uh, during online learning. Not to mention just the supervision, the feedback, uh, the collaboration, the creativity, a lot of aspects of school were really missing. And I fear that, um, you know, a lot of students were, were just left in the basement for this last year and weren't allowed to grow uh, the way that they would have liked to, where their parents would like to and their school would like to. Now, I think that this is compounded by, uh, by California and other states opening up where students are able to, to get right back into the classroom. I'm, I'm afraid that teachers are going to come right back into things without missing a beat. And uh, we're going to have students who you know, maybe took algebra one online during COVID, now find themselves in serious trouble as we move on to geometry and algebra two and don't have the, the prerequisite skills. Not to mention those social emotional skills of students relating with adults, making friends, managing these relationships. A big part of the teenage years is handling and managing those relationships, organizing your day, um, and organizing your life. So uh, I'm seeing a lot of students who, who um, are quite intelligent, uh, but are almost stunted from missing out in life for this last year. And it's quite sad. Now, how do you feel that the, um, the private schools are handling this uh, differently from the standpoint of, of kids coming back into the classroom and especially that social aspect of it, um, you know, more so than the, you know, than the specific math or science type of education. Right. Well, I, I see a lot of schools uh, incorporating social emotional growth into their, into their curriculum more than ever. And uh, certainly at Lake Tahoe Preparatory School, that is a big part of what we do. We have a, a residential life curriculum um, that takes into account all of the different things that we would like students to learn um, from a social and emotional side while they're here on campus, or even a life skills side. You know, we, we really work hard so that students are ready when they go to college, not just academically, but ready for, uh, ready to handle their own lives, ready to do their laundry, you know, to pay their bills. Uh, uh, not, not to mention handling all of the relationships, advocating for themselves, managing their studies, and some, some free time uh, for their headspace. 
you know, that, that's a lot to manage. Um, I see a lot of families moving towards private school in this day for those very reasons, for a more holistic approach to education where we're looking at each and every student and what their individual needs are, um, and then coming up with a plan as educators and stakeholders to target those needs. Uh -huh. Now, so Jesse, you said that, that you have started back uh, doing some of your in-person shows. Um, what differences have you seen um, pre and post COVID uh, with the students and their social ability? Yeah, well, it's interesting because uh, they're, they're still wearing the masks, the, the ones that I've done. Um, so as a, like, if you look at like a stand up comedian and they're, and they're in front of a thing and you can't see their faces, it becomes a, a very different experience. But I found, I think that being social is essential and the kids are just starving for it. And I think it's a really beautiful thing, Paul, that you guys are embracing that um, SEL, social emotional learning, because as we know, life is all about managing relationships and it's all about navigating that part of our lives. And I think now with the, with the phone and with all the technology, it's such an amazing thing. But if, if you're a kid, a young kid, and you can have a little bit of charisma and walk into a room and look people in their eye and shake their hand and take an interest in them, you're, you're like an unbelievable person. I, I felt like the same way in the dating world in today because people suck so much. If you go out and you just open the door and you walk on the inside of the curb, the, 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 a lot of times the girl is like blown away. This guy is incredible. It's like, why? Because you're just doing the bare minimum of what a human should be. You know, the bar has been set so low. So I, uh, I, I think that it's, uh, it's, it's really cool to be in corporate. I don't even remember what your question. I got so excited about talking about people. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. The, the experience has been, I think people are starving to connect in person. It is an essential part of life. And yes, we can do it through a phone. I could FaceTime my parents in Alaska right now and see how their fourth was. But it's not the same as being able to be in front of someone and, and focus. And I, I really do think the, the biggest battle is having some systems in place that guide what your relationship is going to be with the internet, whether it's social media or just searching things. Because if you don't, and I think you guys have probably seen the, the social dilemma on uh, Netflix. Oh, yes. Yeah, You can't Excellent. beat it. You, you, you can't beat it. I know... I know people that are very successful multimillionaires, uh, adults who have gone highs and lows through this pandemic. It's, it's, it's a difficult time for everyone, let alone a kid who, like you're saying, Paul, is developing and, and hormones and, and all these changes and you know, experiencing uh, the different elements of being an adult and under supervision, like you said. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it really is something where it's exciting to me that we're getting back to, um, to some normalcy whatever that means in today's world, because I, I really think it's hurt kids more than it has uh, protected them during this time of being isolated and not being able to be around their peers. Mm -hmm. now, Paul, um, Jesse mentioned masks, but in, in where it took me, one of the things it took me to was talk a little bit about the figurative masks that so many of the kids that a school like yours deals with, where they're coming in with not the not the mask that, that, that we're now getting because of COVID, but that mask that they have started to wear based on the influences that they've had in their life prior to them coming to you. Yes, absolutely. A great question. You know, uh, so many students come to us these days as fallout from the social network uh, kind of revolution. You know, these are kids who are so anxious, uh, uh, just thinking about getting into their day. It's so daunting. They don't want to get out of bed and go to that big high school, um, you know, where, where there are there's so many different factors from bullies to friends to teachers to whatnot. Uh, the, the thought of all of those social relationships is just mind numbing for them. And, and so I see so many kids these days who are that, who are just who are victims to, to social media and to the cell phone uh, generation. You know, when I was a kid, the bullies couldn't come home with you. Right. You know, and you, you only spoke Great to who you wanted to speak to on the phone and it was a safe place. But now, you know, the cell phone comes with you and, and so do it to, to everyone in the world. Um, I think that we all need to go back and remember how sensitive we are to the words of our peers and to the words of others during those teenage years. There's really no other time like that in your life. 
um, we're just so sensitive. And I think that um, it's really easy for adults to forget a little bit about that. I'll tell you that every day when I come in to work, on my drive to work, I try to remember exactly what it feels like to be a teenager. Uh, because it really is that unique feeling. Um, so it, it, it's just really tough for those kids. And what we do, we take the phones away. We, we don't allow phones during the daytime. Uh, my ninth, 10th and 11th graders don't use cell phones uh, between 8 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. in the afternoon. And in, instead of the technology, we focus on FaceTime. Hi, how are you? You know, real people greeting each other with a smile, you know, in a small community where everyone knows your name and we're all happy that you're here. That allows us to really focus on the holistic needs of that particular child. Uh, we do like to allow students to have cell phones. This generation was born with them. So it's, it's difficult to take it away completely. And, and when you do, uh, you, you certainly get some pushback. So we give them a couple of hours in the evening to connect with their families, uh, uh, to talk via Zoom or FaceTime, what have you, talk to their friends, do a little social media, but we filter our internet content and uh, we don't let them have this all day. So that makes the, the social media environment a much less daunting place um, for a lot of kids. And I think that um, uh, uh, small private schools or small private day schools are fantastic for this type of holistic education um, where everyone knows who you are. It's not the kind of place where you have to be afraid of, of who you might meet or what's happening next. To take that a step further, when you have a small student body, we don't really have room for enemies. We don't have really have room to be rude to others. Everyone needs friends and there's not room on a small campus uh, for that kind of behavior. So those are some of the things that we like to do to, to uh, decrease anxiety. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it. Now, I, I got a question for, for both of you guys. Um, with this, with relations to the cell phones, what age do you think that kids should have their own phone? Because I have two nephews, nine and 11 right now. And they're at that age where all the other kids are getting phones. Uh, the, the oldest has a watch that he can do text messaging from. Um, but it's such a tricky thing because even if they, you're like, you want to be the parent that's like, oh, I don't want them to, to be uh, having exposure to this type of technology. At this point, they're the kid that doesn't have it. And they're, they're going to see anything they want to see at school because all the other kids do. So uh, what do you guys think about that? Paul, go ahead. Yeah, this is such, I, not the first time I've had this question. Yeah, Very yeah. difficult to answer. Uh, I have, my own kids are, you know, my, my, my oldest is seven. So I am I'm fastly approaching this question in my own home. Uh, I have a variety of different answers. I think that that is a tough part, to give a hard and fast answer to that question is too difficult. I think it depends on the family dynamic. I think it depends on the character of the child. I think it depends on the siblings, the school, the, the rules of the community. So I think that there's a lot at play there. Um, I'm also savvy to the fact that the kid that's not allowed to eat sugar at home might go to college and go completely nuts eating everything that they never got to have. So yep. I think that the most important piece, just like we're teaching with my teens here on campus is to teach moderation, everything in moderation. So, you know, regardless, I, Regardless of what age you're going to introduce the cell phone, I think that the, the more important piece is that we don't get unfettered, unfiltered access to the internet right away the first time that we get it. And that, um, that, that children are taught responsible use. I think that if you're in a household and mom and dad are spending the entire time walking around like this and say, yeah, 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 kid, yeah, 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 that's not fair. Uh, that's just not fair. You're not teaching responsible use. So I think the first step is setting up parameters um, for safety, uh, number one, and to just teach responsible use as we move on through, uh, through high school. You know, I, I, so I can't give you a hard and fast rule for any particular kid, but I can tell you that I am planning on helping my son to earn his first cell phone around the ages of perhaps between 12 and 14. But that'll be a device that he pays for himself yep. that has parental controls on it and has certain hours where it has to be turned in at a particular place in my house that he'll be responsible to put it there and then retrieve it. And mm -hmm. we'll have a whole bill of 
we'll have a cell phone bill of rights that we both sign and that's great yeah i love that i love that. i think that's necessary or else it, it yeah I, I go out to or used to go out to restaurants and you look around and every person's on a on a device and uh it's so much easier to, to just put the young child with the ipad yes. and because the parent you know needs wants a break and, and maybe it deservedly is. so but it's a it's a tough balance. And you know what? This is a this is an interesting that you bring that one up because you know before I had kids, I would always look at that too. Oh, what a shame! Yeah, 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 yeah. But you you actually and, and so I'm gonna speak up for this one too because now I've changed my tune. You don't really know what goes on at home. Yes. And it may be like when I'm on the airplane, you might see my kids and they're on that iPad and they're watching a movie and you think, oh my gosh, how's he ready? But what you wouldn't know is that's the only time that they ever get it is right there on that airplane. That's the treat. And I say, that's right. And I save it because that's when I need them to be engaged, right? Yeah. To make it through that long flight. And that way they're quiet and no one's crying on the airplane and we get to our destination and everyone's happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's a win. It's a win. Yeah. It's a win-win. Alan, Alan well, do you yeah. have any so, thoughts on that? Yeah. I was just going to say, first of all, Paul, you, you touched on so many great things. And I hope that everybody picked up on that. And by the way, this is a great, uh, great show for parents to sit down with their, their uh, children and, and let them hear some of these answers and what some of the reasons are, because I think that's great. And especially the earning it part. So a lot of the things that you touched on are the things that I'm, that I was thinking of, but I did think of something because yesterday I was at, at, at a 4th of July party and I was talking to a young man, uh, a father who whose son just turned 18 and um and at the, on the day his son turned 18 he turned off tracking on the phone because when he had gotten wow. the phone the father said you know that you know you know that you're you know you're a minor and you're my responsibility so i you know i need to be able to know where you're at so on his 18th birthday he turned off tracking and so when he came home that day, his dad says, oh, I see you turned off tracking. He says, yeah, you know, because I'm 18 now. And he said, and that's fine. H hang on here. Here's your, here's the phone bill. And, you know, reached over and, and handed it to him and said, then I guess that means that you're adult enough now to start paying the phone bill. So here, here it is. And he said, well, I don't know about that. And he said, okay, well, just turn tracking back on until such time that, <laughs> that you feel um, that, that, uh, you can pay the phone bill. Uh, you know, but anyway, so a reality like, check. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there, there's responsibilities that come with certain things, you know, and if you say I'm adult enough to do this, sure. I, I agree with you and here's the bill for it. Uh, so, okay. you know, it's, to me, it's, it's just part of that good communication with your kids. You know, you, you set boundaries uh, as long as they know the reason that the tracking is on there is not because we don't trust you. It's on there because we love you and because we're adults and and part of our job as parents is to make sure that you're OK. And so this is one of the ways in which we're able to do that, because I don't think you want us going with you everywhere. So we'll leave tracking on. And he said, you know, his son, yeah, I'll leave it on. <laughs> So anyway, I just thought that'd be another little addition to it. But Paul, I think you touched on a lot of great things. Great. So um, I was going to uh, go ahead, Jesse. I think you had something else. Well, do we are, do we need to go to a break here in a second, or can I can I throw us in a direction? Well, uh, well I would say, why don't you throw us in a direction, and then we're going to go to break right after that. Okay. So here's what I'm thinking about, and I want to hear you guys weigh in on this. Is I kind of come from a perspective that kids are too soft today. I think they could use some toughness, some grit and some resilience. It seems like everything is some type of disorder or, or anxiety and mental health. And these are things that I wanna help with and I'm um, passionate about. But at the same time, like, I you kind of touched on it earlier with the victimization. It's like, at some point you gotta take responsibility for your life and be like, okay, I'm not happy with this, this wasn't fair, but what now? What am I going to do about it now? And um, all these things that we're talking about are so great. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, there's adults that someone said something to them. And now they say, well, I'm in a bad mental health space. And it's like an excuse. It's like, yeah, people are going to say mean things to you. Life's not going to be fair. Um, how do we balance that? Because it isn't the kid's fault. Because like you said, they grew up in this world 
where they've had a cell phone their entire life. They've been on social media. They never had any real, and there are kids that have gone through difficult things, but life is better and easier now than it's ever been in the history of the world. So to give them that perspective of like, wow, you don't realize how amazing, oh, the Wi-Fi is slow. That's your big, that's your big cross to bear in this life, you know? So I want to know if you guys even think kids are too soft and how do we toughen them up, but also in an understanding way that it is, you know, not putting all of it on them because it's just the world that they've known and they, they can't change that. That wasn't up to them. All right. So Paul, if you can think about that one for a minute and for everybody out there, we're going to take a break, but we're going to be right back. You're listening to Answers Network on LA Talk Radio. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers Network. And my guest co-host today is Jesse LeBeau. And our guest is Paul Otis. And when we went to break, uh, there was a question just in regards to what can we do uh, to sort of change the situation that we have now? Is our kids too soft? Uh, Do they need to toughen up? What are some of the things that we can do, or Paul, some of the things that you see in uh, working with the young people you do at your school? Sure. Well, being a science teacher, I'm a, I'm a biology teacher, and you know, I, I go back to human evolution with a lot of this stuff every time. And uh, I don't think that kids are softer today. I think kids are the same as that they've been for thousands of years. But I think that what we're requiring of kids is quite different. And I think that kids are allowed... Uh, um, when, when, to, to be soft when everything is done for you, when things are automated for you, when your parents and the adults around you uh, alleviate all suffering from your life or, or any struggle um, or any risk, I think that those um, kind of make it a sanitary existence for kids. Uh, mm-hmm. I like to see kids exposed to risk. I like to see kids exposed to, exposed to a struggle. I like to see them hungry. Uh, you know, I, kids are, kids are still resilient. I've got some ski racers out there that I've seen fall down and spit blood and get up and ski again and win, you know, uh, kids are tough, but we have to, we have to, uh, uh, expect that from them. Um, so I, I think that a lot of the environments that kids are, are growing up in these days due to tech, due to social media, um, all the different resources that they have, but particularly due to parenting. You know, I, I think that every time that I meet a set of parents for a particular student, I understand better uh, why that student is the way that they are, for good or for bad. You know, mm-hmm. I think that um, it's important for parents. If you're that parent of that two-year-old, let them get up on their own. You know, uh, get up, you fell down, okay, get up off the ground. That's a metaphor that is going to ring true for the rest of their lives. And especially when it comes to the teen years. Because if we do it all for kids, or we allow them to have this easy, sanitary existence where, oh, you know, nothing is your fault, honey. You know, that's not, you have a a, a kid who's growing up into a young adult who, like we were talking about before, wants to blame everything that happens in their life on somebody else. You know, Um, life just happens to me rather than making it happen. And, you know, it was, it was uh, about 10 years back when some other educators and I here at the school, we started 
really thinking about and looking at what does success look like for our students. And when we looked at some of that, what we found are the epiphany moments, like we talked about, the aha moments, where all of a sudden you had a kid that was on a bad track who might have been blaming everything in the world, uh, you know, everything that happened in their life on the rest of the world. And all of a sudden now this is a positive person who has found a passion and just wants to pursue that passion. And we go, wow, when we can help a kid to get to that epiphany moment, it's like our work is done. They're ready to go. You know, they're, they're, they're on to the next thing. Uh, and so how do we foster that? Uh, amongst kids. And so that's something that I have really focused on in the last decade. Um, and, you know, that's not a fine science by, by any means, but we like to put together all of the right conditions so that kids can find their own passion. It's never something that you're going to be able to do for your child, but you can set up all the right conditions for your child to go out and seek their own passion. You know, one of the uh, one of the things that I like people to bring up because I I envision myself as one of the viewers or listeners. Um, share with us one of the experiences, one of your favorite experiences, where the student reaches that epiphany moment, and talk a little bit about what you feel the student was going through, as well as what you were going through when they reached it. Sure, sure. So I'd like to talk briefly about a student that I've known for many years, and. Um, he actually came to me early in my career. Um, I, was, I was teaching uh, biology here and, and also uh, leading a rock climbing club and leading, leading downhill skiing. And this young man was one of the most hyperactive students I've ever had, ever worked with. Uh, he had a very difficult time staying in his chair, uh, nonstop talking, nonstop conversation, very, very difficult to, um, to keep attention on, on one stimulus in front of me. And so I saw this with this young man, an avid skier. And so I went out skiing with him and I noticed that when he's skiing, he could just focus on that run. He would make perfect turns. He had lots of energy. And I realized, man, you know, they say that back at school, they would talk about this kid having a learning disability, but he's got special powers. I mean, this guy's a superhero. How can I help him to channel what I'm seeing out here on the mountain into the class? And so that's what I did. And I worked with him out rock climbing and I worked with him out skiing. And I talked to him, you know, you know, when you're out skiing, are you thinking about anything else? When you're rock climbing, do you think about anything other than that next grip? He said, no, no, I'm just focused on that next grip. That's all I'm thinking about, Mr. Otis. It's like, well, what about when you're in my biology class? Oh, I'm all over the place. I'm thinking about this and that and what's for lunch. And I said, okay. So what I want you to do, I want you to really focus on that feeling, that feeling that you have when you're skiing and you're not thinking about anything else, that feeling that you have when you're climbing, and you're not thinking about anything else. And now I want us to practice turning it on and turning it off in the classroom for a couple minutes at a time. And this is one of the most medicated students I've ever worked with. You know, it was very, very difficult for him and very difficult for his family. But through this kind of one-on-one -on -one work with, that I did with him, he was incredibly successful, graduated with a 4.0 GPA. Uh, he has gone on to, to college. He's now uh, in a graduate's degree where he's gonna become a, a filmmaker. And I'm just so proud of this young man. He called me in May to let me know that he had graduated and just wanted to hear my voice. And I think that it's having these kinds of relationships, having the people who are here to catch those kids slipping through the cracks, that's an important piece. You know, if I hadn't found this student and sought him out, he wouldn't have sought me out. He wouldn't have sought out this kind of, this kind of mental control, this kind of learning. And so I think that it's really important for students to have relationships and find mentors, uh, aside from parents a lot of times. Um, but more than anything, you know, have the adults in charge having that holistic approach. I'm not just looking at what's happening in the class. I wanna look at what the kid is eating. I wanna look at how they're exercising and look at that whole picture and get to know them to know how best to teach them. I, I love that. And uh, I just want to commend you and acknowledge the ability and the passion that you have to go beyond your role at one point, just doing the biology in the classroom. But that's really what it takes in the research. And my experience, I've seen that just a role model that 
that actually cares, that they can feel cares, that consistently puts in time in showing that they love by, hey, what are you into? Skiing. Okay. Uh, what are you into? All right, let's go throw the football around. And that's the thing that the, the research really shows makes the difference in these kids' life is that consistent, caring adult. And it's so cool because you're saying it from the perspective of like, you meet the parent and you can tell a lot about them. Yeah. Um, we get calls with, with what we're doing from parents all over the country. And you, man, you hear these crazy things that they're going through um, and it, it gives you a little bit better understanding. But I am kind of on the flip side of that. I go into a lot of schools and I can meet the principal. And with fi within five minutes, I can look at my partner that comes with me a lot and, and I could go, okay, this one might be a little bit of a, uh, we're going to have to really work to get the kids right. honed in because the, the, you could tell they respect the leadership. And if you go in there and the person's real sharp and it's someone like yourself, you're like, okay, this is going to be a really fun experience today. And 90 plus percent of the time that ends up being the case. So um, I, I just love that you're, that you're doing that. It's going above and beyond because uh, especially it seems like at this point where you are, a lot of times people start off with that enthusiasm in the beginning of whatever it is they're passionate about, whether it's that aha moment for a kid. Oh, I want to, I want to pursue and, and be the best trumpet player. And they're all into it for a few months, but it's, it's what you do once that, that fire goes away and the enthusiasm, do you stick with it and have that hard work and that passion? So, um, I, I just love that. Do you have any other like, um, things that we can do to help point kids to that aha moment? Well, uh, I, absolutely. Um, I, yeah. I did want to just say, though, that I, I loved how you brought up leadership because, you know, the reason I do this, because I was a protege, you know, multiple times over in my life, I had older people, you know, and I was a quiet kid. I had some promise, but nobody, you know, saw it, took an interest in me. I had a couple of older people who plucked me out and they saw something in me. And, and they poured themselves into me the way that I did for this young man and have fun for others. And when you do that, you plant that seed. And this becomes a chain because that kid I'm talking about, he's going to be a leader for somebody else someday. And I exactly. just feel that, you know, yeah, yeah. I think that to, it, it, to foster these kinds of things, you just have to take a kid to do everything. You got to keep them busy and you got to show them the world and a variety of experiences throughout that world. You know, you need to get them out of your hometown but you need to keep them busy all summer trying out sports and musical instruments and art and being creative and tech and everything else in the world. They're going to pick it. They're going to pick their passion. They're going to find it on their own. You just need to show them, uh, you know, a smorgasbord of different things, you know, so that they can happen organically. Because if you try to pick it for someone, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. And it's okay to have multiple passions in life. Yeah. It's okay to give up one thing for another. As long as you're doing something, you know, yeah. it's good. Yeah. Well, and, so, try, so try lots of things. Taste and try different right. things. And you get your kid out of the basement. You can't let them be stagnant. Keep them busy. They're going to just sit if you leave them a lot of the time. You yeah. got to kick them out of the house, you know get them out there active and doing. And the next thing you know, they're going to find it. And that's when they're going to take on that positive growth mindset where it's just positivity, uh, uh, a positive view of the world. You know, now, I, I'll go ahead, Alan. No, 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 no I, well, I was just going to talk a little bit about the, the concept of, of looking at everybody as an individual. Because I think that's one of the things that, that I'm not sure if everybody's picking up on is each child is going to be different in the way in which you approach them. And, and you as an educator are picking up on those things and you're doing something for this particular young man that may not necessarily work for someone else. And I get people that ask me sometimes about you know, private school. Well, you know, what's the big deal about private school or what's this? It's so valuable. The idea you mentioned earlier, the smaller class size, important. They can focus better. And, and working with them as an individual, uh, your public schools are sort of like a cookie cutter type of thing to where they're being told, you know, you have to do everything within these parameters and everything has to be like this. And it's much more difficult than for a particular child who might be incredibly gifted. Um, I had a young man that I was transporting one time and, and he said, well, you're probably just like everybody else. You probably think that I'm a big loser and you probably think that, 
you know, you know, that I'm just going to lie to you and you probably, and he's going through all of these different things. And I said, no, I go, have you lied to me? And he goes, no. And I go, why would I think that? Well, that's what everybody else says, you know, and it's like, no, we don't. And, and he kept saying, but he kept talking down about himself. And I said, here's what I see based on, on, on what you've told me and based what, from what I've learned, you've been operating outside of a parameter that was set for you within this school. But there's people that are operating outside of that parameter because they're superior, not because they're deficient. So don't put yourself in a position to say, I must be a loser. Or if anybody told you that, that's their problem, not yours. And I think that you get that so much more when you're operating out of a, a, a private school system that can focus on each individual young person. And, and anyway, I just I don't know if anybody else was picking up on that, but that was one of the things, Paul, I was getting. And I think another thing was when you mentioned, I could see you light up and, and I've had people ask, why do you do what you do? You know, I mean, I, I don't, you know, it's, you know, you put in all of this work and oftentimes it, it certainly doesn't pay well or, you know, or whatever. And I can say this about, you know, both of you, because I know both of you. Um, that's the reason that phone call that Paul got of that child afterwards telling them how great they're doing or the messages that Jesse gets from the parents or from the kids about how great they're doing. That's a high that you can't experience any other way. And there's no amount of money that can take you to that high when you know that you're seeing it later on, on how, how that has now turned into something wonderful. So I just, I don't know if anybody else is picking up on that, but those are the things. If anybody asks, why do you do that? Or why do they do that? That's the reason why. Love it. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you feel like a lot of parents that you um, have seen sometimes push on what they want the, the uh, like their identity is based on so they were the big basketball star so they want their kid to be the sports you know uh, star of the thing and then it, it becomes not about the kid but an extension of the the parent's ego is that yeah, something I, you I've, cer I've certainly that? seen that a lot of different dynamics at play uh, uh, parents who expect their kids to yeah, follow in their footsteps and they they're very different people um, I've, I also see the the situation where parents are expecting a younger sibling to follow in the footsteps of an older sibling. And maybe that younger sibling has a harder time studying or in class, but has other great aspects to, to, to them and their personalities. So yeah, I, I think it's really easy for, for us as adults to kind of project what we would like to see from, from a child. And I think it's really important to give them, it's just like a plant. You give the plant the water, the sunlight, the soil, the nutrients, and then you sit back and you see what beautiful thing grows, you know? And I think it's the same thing needs to happen with your children. You don't know what they're going to be like. They're, there's going to be a piece of you that's going to grow inside of them, but it probably won't be the whole you again. So you should definitely be prepared for that with kids. And that's the wonderful thing about kids, you know? They're going to be their own individuals. They're gonna take a piece of mom, they're gonna take a piece of dad, uh, but they're gonna be their own person and that's, you have to remember how cool it is to watch that character come out. It's really an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. that's 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 beautiful. And I just happened to glance at the time. I can't believe we were having so much fun, but we we whipped through the time real quickly. <laughs> um, so, Paul, what I'd like to do there, there's a couple of questions that have came in or comments. Um, if you can provide uh, the best way to get in contact with you in email, your website, or something like that. I'm going to ask you these questions. Um, I mean, if there's a real quick little answer you can give them, but if there's a more detailed answer you would like to, um, I want the people that sent these in to go ahead and go to your website or to email you directly to get a more, uh, a greater answer, um, if, if that's okay. This first one reads, I love the anthology of the aha moment. It made me think of my own son and how I saw him change when he sunk the basket uh, that won the final game of the season. Uh, he had struggled as an athlete mainly because he just did not feel he was as good as some of the quote stars on the, on the team. Um, that um, not good as really seemed to keep him somewhat shut down as a person. I have to say that what I, uh, what I read in the summary so, um, so hit my heart 
uh, you know, as we as parents also need to find ways to help our kids have those moments of feeling good about themselves. I'm really looking forward to this show and I hope you will speak to how parents can participate in this process too. Uh, so again, if you can touch on a little bit more, you already did a little bit. This is from Anita in New Mexico. Anita, thank you so much for that. Um, and gosh, we're, we're out of time, but this other one is, can you discuss a little more about, uh, about how you can help kids find their passions? Also, um, uh, how you dealt with the COVID masks and the distancing for students while attending your school, um, what your plans are in regards to moving forward. Um, you know, I have so many friends with teens who are very upset with the continued restrictions placed on our kids, many who are now struggling with depression and or anxiety. They're looking for solutions, even if it means sending their kids to a school or program where they can find uh, some sense of normal interaction uh, with others their age. Thank you so much. This is from Benita in California. Um, for both of you, thank you so much for, for coming on and, and for being the men that you are and doing the things that you do. Um, if both of you, if you can share your websites again, and if people have additional questions, uh, you can contact them directly. Awesome. Yeah, thank you again. Thank you again, Paul. This was a uh, good ask you. We're gonna have to. We're gonna have to do it again because I want to exactly. ask you a bunch more questions. I just really appreciate what you're doing uh, and making a difference in these kids' lives. It's awesome. So thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you so much, and I appreciate both of your work as well. You can absolutely find us online and my my personal email at www.laketahoeprep.org, where you can take a virtual tour of our school. And feel free to contact me with any questions that you might have about our program or just help with your kid. All right. And Jesse. Oh, just yeah, just, yeah, Jesse, you can just find me online, Jesse LeBeau everywhere. So easy. All right. Again, again, thank you both so much. Uh, and for everybody out there, please join us next Monday when we will be joined by Dave Jennings to discuss his new book, The Pit of Success, How Leaders Adapt, Succeed, and Repeat. And please visit our archives of past interviews at answers.network. And you can subscribe to the show through iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, Spreaker, um, PoogieTube. <laughs> <laughs> and many other popular po podcasts. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. It helps us reach more people. And I want you to know we greatly appreciate it. Next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page, check out some of our latest shows. If you like them, please like us, spread the word. The more we can spread positive information out there, the better we can make a difference in our young people. For everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers Network. Hello, I'm Marty Cove. You might remember me from roles such as Sensei in the Karate Kid films. I've done over 100 films and countless stunts in my career, and I've always given 100%. With the damage done to my body over time, I needed to find relief from my chronic pain. My passion for health and fitness drove me to find a natural way to combat muscle pain. Teaming up with doctors, detectives, and a compounding pharmacist, We've created Marty's Cobra Cove Ultra Strength CBD Cream. It's the only thing that has been strong enough to knock out my pain. And fast. Honestly, you may have tried the rest, but it's time to try the best. It's legal, it's safe, and 100% effective. Show your pain. No mercy. Go to www.martyscobracove.com. You're listening to Answers Network with Alan Cardoza, only on LA Talk Radio.